Good evening. If you are wondering what you're looking at, if you will recall in my previous video, I mentioned that there was this new neighbor I had hanging outside my window. This is just a continuation of that. I just wanted to show you that the following day, despite the cold weather, the thing continued to cling to the screen outside my window. And then it started moving and making its slow and steady way across, like very slowly. And I don't really know what it was heading towards because, like I said before, I didn't see any other bugs outside this whole entire time. I don't know if it maybe like it ate bugs at night and it came back. It doesn't look like it. Maybe it would catch bugs as it came in. I have no idea. I have so many questions, but it made its way to the right of the screen, as you can see right there. And then it just kind of started turning back. You don't see it in this video clip, but it really looks like it was staring into my window, which is maybe just my imagination getting to me because I've been listening to too many episodes of the Magnus Archives, which as I mentioned before, is this horror podcast that I'm obsessed with. There's this episode about this character that has arachnophobia, and he is being haunted by this ghost spider. So every time he kills it, it just comes back, and he finds out later on that he accidentally killed it when he was a kid, and now it's just following him around. This kind of reminded me of that, because that thing is shaped like a spider, as I said before, and it just keeps on hanging there. It's gone now, but I think it's like just hanging out of sight. Like I really think it is, and I just don't see it. But anyways, enough of the bug. I am talking about graphic novels today, and this is part of my assignment for work, where I have to read Asian American YA books and I am just not very happy about it because it's like I said it's com a completely outside of my comfort zone and most of them are contemporary novels which I just don't read but in this case I'm actually very excited because um, these graphic novels I read them and they were a lot of fun so the first book that I read is I'm just gonna hold it up because I received free print copies, so I can actually hold up the print copies to show you, which is nice when it comes to graphic novels, because you kind of want to see like what the art looks like. So the first one is called A Map to the Sun by Sloane Leong. And this is a basketball book, which, like I mentioned before in a previous video, I hate basketball. Like I do not care about it. Not that I don't like sports. I like soccer. I don't mind hockey. I am obsessed with Haikyuu, which is about volleyball. And I love watching individual sports, like um, solo sports figure skating, um, skiing, snowboarding, stuff like that. But I have never been able to get in basketball. In fact, like the other sport that I hate, which is baseball, is preferable to basketball, in my opinion. <laughs> um, I can't even watch like anime about basketball, because that's how little I care about it. But for you know this assignment, I had to read this book. And this uh, book focuses on a girls' basketball team in the inner city that has just been formed by a brand new coach who has absolutely no coaching experience. <laughs> she is new to the school and I think she's pretty new to teaching itself and there's a lot of pushback when she suggested they're like there's no budget for it. Um, the male, like the men's basketball team, the coach really does not want to share like the court or share practice time, anything like that. But she manages to gather these five girls to form a basketball team. And two of the girls actually have some history with each other because they were friends a couple years ago when they met while playing basketball on the streets. So one of them is Ren, and the other one is Luna, who is this um, half Chinese, half white girl from Hawaii. And when they met years ago, Luna is very, you know, friendly and um, charismatic. And they, like, she basically befriended Ren, and they became super close over the course of the summer. And then Luna just disappears from her life and never, um, like, contacts her again. But at the beginning of this book, Luna is the new student that has just transferred to their school, and she so Ren finds out that Luna has just moved back, and Luna like comes up to her like you know during break and just talks to her as if nothing has happened, like wants to become friends again, wants to pick up where they left off, and Ren is just not having it, which causes problems later on because they are you know obviously teammates now, and not only that they are the only two girls on the team with any experience, and the other three girls. Um, come to basketball because two of them are mutual friends of these two so they just get kind of dragged into it like one is a girl who not only doesn't know anything about basketball she doesn't play sports at all like in fact um, she gets made fun of a lot by her brothers and her classmates because she's overweight so she's very self-conscious about that and um, like just exercise in general is like new to her but it she's kind of um, like getting into it and it like she says she feels a lot better and healthier just from playing sports and um, there's um, another girl who is 
uh, very tough um, and is actually having a kind of affair with one of the teachers. So she has her own issues and she's just kind of uh, forced to go along with the other girls because they're her closest friends and they're all in like you know on the basketball team. And the fifth girl gets recruited solely because of her height. Like she's um, this quiet kind of gamer girl who has like a very like popular sister and like she's the complete opposite of her sister but it's through this basketball team that she I guess like finds her place so this book like I'm used to reading sports fiction like of course they focus on the team aspect of it the friendships like the problems that the athletes have outside as well but the game is always the focus so I thought with um, this book it was kind of unique that the sports was kind of like a almost like a supporting character it was like a side thing that these girls did and it helped them in their personal lives because they have a lot of like personal struggles that they go through being girls from low-income backgrounds in like um, the inner city so they like you know like Ren has an older sister who has drug problems and um, is always asking for money and her father who's a single father always gives in and she feels that like her sister is ruining their lives and um, like you know Luna's lost her mom and lives with her aunt um, and like all, all of them have like their own like struggles and those are the main things that like the author chooses to um, like to, to to focus on and um, but I really like this book I gave it four out of five stars my biggest problem with it is just this like okay, so the sunset color scheme right here is quite lovely I am a big fan of pink I like the color pink and it's um, it's very fitting but like you know the panels are nice and everything you know with even with the color scheme but the problem I had was that I am like I'm very face blind, even in real life. Like I cannot remember faces. Like I just have a lot of trouble with it. And like I've been reading comics since I was a little girl, but even with like the big ones like Marvel, where I followed the same character over the course of like however many issues, if there is another character in a panel that has similar hair or is wearing similar clothing, I just have so much trouble telling them apart. Like I, and it kind of actually, like I have to go back and reread several panels and I'm like, wait a minute, like who actually said that line? Um, but, you know, like with, it, like, so in this book, um, most of the characters are pretty easy to tell apart, but I had some trouble in some of the panels, like especially when they're playing and like they have their hair up in the ponytails. I had to go back because um, with the color scheme, like you couldn't tell which hair color, like, and therefore with me, without the hair color, I couldn't tell which girl was talking and um, that kind of bothered me a little, but like, I don't know, if you end up reading it, let me know if it bothers you, maybe it's just me. But yeah, like um, that was my main problem with the art. The next book I read is completely different. It's called Displacement by Kiku Hughes. And the main character of this is actually also called Kiku because while the story is fictional, it focuses on this, um, the author's family history. So her grandmother's story about being sent to the internment camps back during World War II. And for anyone who's not familiar with it, um, you know, during World War II, um, J Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And immediately after that, they rounded up um, Japanese American citizens on the West Coast, even those who were born here, and uprooted them from their lives. So these people, they were not just people who um, like, you know, randomly came here from Japan or anything like that. Like, they had, like, they were living here, working here, going to school, attending church, temple, what, what have you. And they were just, um, like, forced to register and sent off to these hastily put together camps, like, which kind of reminds me of what's going on with um, the refugees who have come to the U.S. from Central and South America. Um, and have, are put into these camps in like the desert and isolated locations where there is no air conditioning, no heating, and just um, like that's, lots of them are just stables or something like that where humans are not meant to live and they just stick all these families in there and um, just keep them there 
because they think they might be a security threat. And I actually, last year when I was in charge of the nonfiction um, books, like I read another book called American Sutra that talks about the um, experience of Buddhist Japanese Americans, which actually differed from their Christian counterparts, which I didn't know about because like American education system doesn't really, it kind of glosses over this stuff. But I learned a lot about like, you know, um, like resistance efforts in the camps and just, um, but it's more of a quiet, subtle resistance, not like the resistance over in like the, like in Europe where, you know, obviously people are fighting for their lives and trying to get out. Like this is, um, like this is more of like, you know, pushback in order to get a newspaper published, hold elections, um, have funerals because they weren't even allowed to have those because even though, and, and you got to look at um, some of the documents where it was obvious that the government didn't really see all of them as a threat, but it, they, like, in order to make the American people feel better, they had to put on a show about, oh, look, we're, uh, we're keeping the threat contained. So they were put into these camps where there was security set up around, and there were instances where people, like innocent people, just got shot because the guards, I guess, flipped out or something, and decided that they were trying to make a break for it even though like where the hell would you be running you're in the middle of the desert with and there's nothing to go back to because they took away they took your homes and all that stuff but um but yeah so the the book is um from the point of view of kiku like i said and it's set in 2016 right around the time of the american election so that's referenced a lot but kiku is a half white half japanese girl but um they mentioned that so she gets Okay, I'm backtrack. So she gets um, displaced, is what it's called. So she gets sent, and it's which is what's happening with the Japanese American families as well. So um, I don't play in words right there, but she gets sent back in time to when her grandmother and great grandparents have are being registered and sent off to these camps. And even though she is um, not like full Japanese, like they mentioned that even if you're one sixteenth Japanese, you have to register and go be sent to these camps. So because she gets stuck back in time, she ends up living in these camps for like, I think up to a total of six months and she befriends like the other young Japanese Americans there. And so she gets to, she ex gets to, she experiences um, like what it was like to, you know, d live under these conditions with your feet, your rights taken away um, during World War II like as like you know through the eyes of a a teenager and um and it also talks about like you know like i said the resistance efforts that that were brought up in um the american sutra which is the nonfiction book i read last year and um and and she also um goes into like intergenerational trauma and how this uh, the grandmother never really talks about her past and how if you don't talk about these past memories it's not like they're gonna leave you completely like the trauma that you face so you don't get to heal from it and i think that's very important to like discuss because i myself like i so my family is vietnamese so we um i have older relatives like my parents and aunts and uncles that lived through the vietnam war and they just don't really talk about it or they'll talk about it but only in like a very kind of one-dimensional way and like i understand a lot of it is just like you know why do you need to know that like you haven't even been to vietnam stuff like that but it's very obvious from just like seeing like my like my father especially like who fought in the war like there's problems that are obviously hold over from that time that cannot go away because they you refuse to discuss them and i'm sure this is kind of um, a similar situation here i personally think this book should be what they assign to read in, us to read in school instead of like the outdated documentaries and like the history textbook passages that we have to read that nobody actually really reads um yeah, I think a lot of like young people would enjoy reading this instead and they would get a lot more out of it. Next book that I read was Superman Smashes the Clan by Jean Luen Yang. And this book, um, so Jean, I have read some of his books before and never really been a fan. I, I like his um, interviews, I like his blog posts, stuff like that, but I've never um, in, enjoyed his graphic novels as much. But this one changed my mind completely. He says that he um, 
got the idea to write it from like an old Superman comic that came out after World War II. Uh, so it, it was a very popular one, and the premise is that um, Superman uh, defends this Chinese-American family who has just moved to the suburbs from uh, a fictional version of the Ku Klux Klan. And because the Klan here in the U.S. is a registered organization, they couldn't use its actual name because of like legal issues, so they renamed it the Klan of the Fiery Cross. Um, but they wear the pointed hoods and have the same like hierarchical structure, so that you know it's, they're led by a Grant Scorpions. So everyone reading it knows who they're talking about. But in the original story, um, the the little boy in the family, Tommy Lee, is the only character, and, and his father, like they're the only two characters that have names, like his sister and mother don't. Um, but in here, Jean has made, um, like not only, like to Tommy um, has a personality and like background is pretty well fleshed out, and then his, but, but the, the character that becomes, is actually like the protagonist in addition to Clark Kent, is his sister, uh, Roberta Lee. Um, so she like feels like she does, doesn't fit in, like she doesn't like moving to like, being in the suburbs where she, they're the only Asian American family. Like they previously lived in Chinatown, um, and her father is like very keen on the fact that like he's very insistent that they only speak English. Like her mother moved here from China later on, so she speaks like accented English. So she feels more comfortable speaking Chinese. But his like but the father goes like but the father who has moved here because. Um, he got a really good job as a like research department head um, like, um, at a lab in town, I think. So uh, like he keeps on telling his family like you can only speak in English, like even his wife, like especially when there are other people around because he really wants them to be able to fit in. And that's the reality of like how it was like for a lot of Asian Americans back in the day, I'm pretty sure. But um, like I love this book a lot. Like I think um, they do a good job, like, well, Jean does a good job talking about, um, like, how racism works. Like, it, a lot of the, like, the, there's, like, microaggressions that the kids have to deal with at school from very well-meaning white kids, actually. And, um, like, you know, from, like, the father's co-workers making, like, these snide remarks about how, like, he can afford to live in a nicer house than they can. Like, it, like, it must be so nice, like, being Chinese-American getting special treatment from the government, stuff like that. And also um, how, like, the members of the like the clan, like, in here, like, lots of them are just ordinary people in the town. Um, and, like, the Grand Scorpion is somebody who has relatives who really love him, that he cares about a lot himself. And, like, he's a good brother, he's a good uncle, like, just because you're, like, like a, you know, part of like a white supremacist group doesn't mean that you're like you don't have other relationships in your life that that are important to you um like like at the very beginning like it's very hard to phrase this the very beginning clark kent fights an actual um like a villain who is wearing na Nazi regalia, and Jean wants to point out to us that that's not always the case when it comes to racism. Like they don't always have like a Nazi symbol on their chest or anything like that. Like most of the time, they're just ordinary people that have like these beliefs, and um, but but it doesn't mean like you know like they can't change. Like you know like but. Like you can always choose to, to to change your mind about this. Like you can learn and you can grow. And I think that um, that's a very important um, thing, like a very important point to like, to make. And um, and and I also really liked Lois in here. Like I'm really not familiar with DC. Like I read solely Marvel when I was growing up. And DC, my like I only read um, I've only ever read Red Sun which is basically like an alternate universe, right? It's not the typical Superman, Batman that we're used to. And I, um, and my, most of my familiarity with Superman comes from like the various movies over the years, which I've heard lots of mixed reviews and opinions about. So um, Clark and Lois were always just kind of like, eh, to me. Like I don't really care about them very much one way or another. Lois is okay for a love interest, but like never anything special. But in here, like, she is not only, like, a really good reporter, like, super dedicated to her job, she's also incredibly funny and smart, and I can see how, like, why Clark cares about her so much, because I, like, I, I, 
I would love to be her friend. I want to grow up to be like her, even though I'm pretty sure at this point in time, like she's probably younger than me. But, um, but yeah, I gave it five out of five stars, and I'm really looking forward to reading more from Jean Wen Young in this verse. The next book I read is Flamer by Mike Carato. And Mike Carato is a Filipino-American author, and his main character is Aiden Navarro, who is a 14-year-old Filipino-American boy who is at this um, summer camp for Boy Scouts, I think that's what it is. Um, so it's a bunch of teenage boys who are about to go into high school in the mid-90s. And so there's a lot of male bonding, lots of um, sexist jokes about girls, like lots of gross jokes about like, you know, um, penises, stuff like that. Like the things that actually, like there are panels that made me crack up. Like I was laughing out loud just because I think I've never been able to shake my little boy's sense of humor. Uh, the panels, the art here looks kind of like these basic kind of um, pencil sketches, I guess. And the only color is the color of uh, flames. So like they all look like that. But, and I, I, it, it's kind of cute and charming, um, and even though I said, like, this book made me laugh out loud a lot, and there are very, like, there are many funny uh, moments, it's also um, a pretty dark story, because it's um, basically, it's about going through puberty when you're closeted back in the 90s as a Boy Scout, when that was just not acceptable. Aiden gets made fun of a lot by the other boys because he has a high-pitched voice. He doesn't like sports. They think he's girly and they always ask him if he's gay. Um, which, and, and then they tell him, like, you know, if you aren't gay, like his friends, like his, his friends are trying to help out. And they're like, if you, you aren't gay, like, why do you care? But the problem is that he is questioning whether or not he's gay. Like he is starting to realize that he has feelings for his tent mate like I mean they're like roommates but they, they're in a tent together like throughout the course of this um, camp so he, this guy is a football player but he's super nice and um, Aiden has a, a thing for him and so like he's already going through that but there's also like you know the added like the the whole being made fun of by the other boys and like at that age kids can boys can be like very relentless and um, like the only person he can really talk to about this is his best female friend who he has a long distance friendship with like they write letters to each other because this is the 90s and you have to use snail mail but they met each other at church camp which i didn't know was a thing until like a couple years ago my cousin had to go to church camp but uh they like this friendship was born out of that and like he can only talk to her about it and um he's just not comfortable coming out to his other friends so it goes into like um, like those issues that you deal with when you're a teenager and having to navigate like puberty like pretty much on your own since you can't talk to it with anyone else. Um, and there are trigger warnings for like suicidal intent and like just um, suicidal thoughts. So just beware. But I did give this book four out of five stars, and you know I did find it very heartwarming. And the next book I read was. Um, Dragon Hoops by Jean Wen Young. And, um, you know, if you couldn't tell from the cover, this is also a basketball book. Um, but, it's, um, but this time it focuses on a boys basketball team. Um, they're called the Dragons, and it's at this Catholic high school called Bishop O'Dowd. And even though it's a fictional account, he is talking about a real team and real people. So he goes a lot into like the history of basketball, which I thought would like make me fall asleep, but it actually, I ended up getting sucked into it because he, so he tells it through um, like these panels, like where, like, you know, that he uses black and white when he's talking about like um, historical figures, like he talks about like how basketball was invented, how it was adopted and became very popular at the Catholic schools, um, how it's changed over the years and like um, players, of different ethnic backgrounds eventually got accepted into uh, the sport and how women's basketball is different from men's basketball and how it's changed and so on and so forth. Um, but it made me care about basketball, which I never thought would happen just because, like I said before, I've never been into basketball in my life. But he does a very good job uh, weaving in um, like the, the 
aspects of sports fiction that I've always liked, um, as well as like the these autobiographical bits, because the story is told through Gene's point of view. Like he's actually a character in here, like Gene, the teacher, the graphic novelist, the father, and he talks about how hard it is to balance being all those things. Um, you know, meeting the deadlines and everything, and, like, he has to start thinking about what he wants to, like, he has to sacrifice, like, what he wants to prioritize, and the premise is that he's following this basketball team around as they go to competitions and try to win, like, the state championships in California, and this is a team that had, like, um, has made it far before, but they, now they're under, uh, this coach, Lou Ritchie, and he, um, has never ma made it this far before, so that is their, um, ultimate goal. Um, so you're just following them, but they're real people, so there's always this like feeling like, oh no, like, are they actually going to make it? Um, are we going to have our sports fiction moment where they triumph at the end? Like, you know, you can't control, um, like, real life, like, they might end up losing, so there's a lot of that uncertainty, but like I said, it, um, there was a good balance of, you know, basketball with, like, um, the characters, uh, individual stories, and, like, Jean's story, um, and I found it, it was very informative, I thought it was a lot of fun, it was a great sports story, I gave it five stars, and I have yet to look up what actually happened to this basketball team afterwards, but I have a lot of, um, like, I was really rooting for them by the end, so I hope they, uh, they made it far, and all the characters are, um, living good lives right now. <laughs> The last book I read is uh, Shadow of the Bat Girl by Sarah Kuhn, and I actually, like I said, had no idea Cassandra Cain is an Asian American girl. Like, I think she's half white, half Asian, and I don't know if that's like a recent thing, because I know like the Marvel characters, like in the recent years, like they've had, um, like they, they basically um, created different versions of characters who come from different ethnic backgrounds, but um, it seems to me like, it, according to Sarah Kuhn, like, Cassandra Kane has always been part Asian. So um, this book at the beginning, Cassandra um, is the daughter of, um, I guess he's an assassin, like kingpin. Like he, he basically like trains and like controls like all, like this giant network of assassins. And she's meant to be uh, his heir. She's going to take over after he passes. And he's been training her like as a killer all her life. Um, but he doesn't teach her to talk or really communicate. So I don't really know what the hell he's planning because I don't know how you can be a leader without being able to talk or properly communicate to like your goons and minions. But anyways, um, so at the very start, she's had this like epiphany that she doesn't want to live this life anymore. So she's trying to reintegrate herself back into society and having a lot of trouble with it because you know again she couldn't really she can't really talk she hasn't been around other people who aren't crazy or assassins in her life she, she ends up spending a lot of time at the public library because you know it's open to everybody and also she starts to listen like she participates in like she she likes to listen to Barbara Gordon who I actually do know this bit of DC history like Barbara Gordon is Batgirl and she's also a librarian so um Cassandra starts attending these programs run by Barbara where she talks about like um you know Batgirl and like her the previous exploits and like how she kind of disappeared and, and re I guess retired unofficially and we know why that happened but Cassandra and the other people in the story don't um, so she gets it in her head that she has to find Batgirl bring her back out of retirement and get her to get rid of Cassandra's father because he is a villain and you know the um, in the, the course of the book like she starts to befriend Barbara, um, she kind of um, like adopts the library as her second home, and she also makes friends with this other teenage boy who shelves books at the library, and he starts this romance novel book club, and Cassandra and this boy are the only two members as nobody else shows up or no one's interested in it. Um, and she also gets taken under the wing of this uh, ramen shop owner who just wants to feed her, and she's this like badass Japanese American auntie figure. But it's um, there's a lot of like the found family thing going on, and I liked that a lot. And they um, help Cassandra as she like starts learning how to, I guess like uh, be a member of society and civilization again after the life that she has lived. So. 
I uh, gave this 4 out of 5 stars. I did like it. Um, it wasn't perfect, but I am looking forward to reading more of this verse as well. So that got extremely long, but you know, I really enjoyed reading all these books and I didn't give anything lower than four stars. And I wish I could just say that these are my nominations. Like I just want to say these are the books that I choose, but of course I have to be fair and objective, so I have to also consider all the other YA novels I have to read. But you know, I'm really tempted to just say that these are the books that, like the best books of this year. But anyways, I'm just going to end right there and have a good night and remember to vote if you're in the U.S. because the elections are coming up in just two days. Yikes. Bye.